Welcome everyone to this video by Learn Civil Engineering where we will be learning about trusses. In this video we will be introducing the principles of truss structures, the theory behind internal forces in truss members and we will also learn how to solve a truss structure using the method of sections and the method of joints. Trusses are commonly found in large structures and particularly for large spans. Some examples of such structures that you will likely be familiar with are the Eiffel Tower in Paris and the Quebec Bridge, which has a span of 549 metres. Trusses are made of multiple straight bars that are connected to one another with hinges, and therefore they do not carry moments. This results in a significant advantage where the connections between the elements are simple, as they do not carry moments, and so the behaviour of the truss structure is relatively simple. In this video we will be focusing on plain truss structures, However, the majority of the ideas that we cover can be adjusted for three-dimensional truss structures. We will start off by quickly introducing some traditional planar truss designs. These include the Pratt, Howe, Warren, Fink, Baltimore and Typo K trusses. Although it's not important to have all of these memorised, it is a good idea to be aware of them. But before we look at analysing an entire truss structure, we must understand how to analyse internal forces within individual elements. When a load is applied to a structure, the structure transmits the forces and moments to the foundations. Each element within the structure will provide a certain resistance to the load, which is dependent on the element's dimensions and the material it's made of. And if either of these are insufficient to resist the load, the element, and therefore the structure, will fail. A simple example of the forces and moments transmitted through an element in a structure is a length of rope. Imagine we have this rope of arbitrary length which has been tied on the left hand side and is being pulled in the right hand direction. This pulling action can be represented by the force F, parallel to the rope and acting towards the right, and this force is being transmitted along the entire length of rope. In this example, our internal force, F, is an axial force as it's being applied along the axis of the element. However, internal forces can also be shear, which are perpendicular to the element, or they can be moments, which result in bending moments. For our simple example of the rope though, we are only concerned with axial forces, as ropes cannot resist and therefore cannot transmit either shear forces or moments. Within structural analysis, positive axial forces are tensile forces, leading to an increased length of the element that's being subjected to the force. And so, it follows that negative axial forces are compressive forces, which tend to reduce the length of an element. So, again, thinking back to our example, the pulling action applied to our rope is a tensile force, so the internal force within the rope is a positive axial force. The rope is able to resist a tensile force to a certain extent, however, it could not resist a compressive force at all. Within civil engineering, steel rebar is a common example of this. It has a high tensile strength, but a relatively low compressive strength. On the other hand, a block of concrete will have a very low tensile strength and a very high compressive strength, and this is why steel rebar is used to strengthen concrete, as its high tensile strength complements the concrete's high compressive strength. But back to our trusses now. With this knowledge of compressive and tensile forces, a horizontal or vertical force will have no meaning if it's not relative to the element within a truss, and therefore we need to know if the forces are parallel or perpendicular to the axis of the element. An additional consideration for internal forces within elements are that they can be a set of forces or moments equivalent to a section of the structure on either side of an element. For this, if the section of the structure to the right of an element was removed by cutting the element in half, the internal forces are introduced to the cut section, so the remaining structure will still be in equilibrium. Going back to our example of the rope, this can be represented by cutting the rope in half. Considering only the length of rope on the right, we have the tensile force F acting in the right direction. Now, analysing the equilibrium of the section of rope, we know that the internal force in the rope at the point of the section is a tensile force with magnitude of F. This is acting in the left direction like so, and now we can see that this part of the structure is in equilibrium. A general rule is that if you were to divide any structure into two separate parts, if you replace each part by the internal forces in the cut section, both parts of the structure will be in equilibrium. 
Now let's have a look at a truss example. As we stated at the beginning, trusses are made up of straight bars that are connected to one another by hinges. Consider this statically determinate truss that for the purpose of this video has no self weight and is subject only to loads applied in the nodes. Now illustrating the free body diagram of one of these bars, we have an axial force being transmitted throughout the bar, a shear force which is perpendicular to the bar and a moment. However, the bar is connected via hinges at both ends, so the moment at either end must be equal to zero. With the bar being in equilibrium, if we were to sum the moments relative to the left hinge to equal zero, VB would be equal to zero, as it's the only force that has perpendicular distance from the left hinge, and therefore the only force that can apply a moment to it. Now, with VB being equal to zero, again, as the bar is in equilibrium, we know that VA must also be equal to zero. HA and HB may have magnitudes depending on the figures applied to the situation. Therefore, we can conclude that bars within a truss, i.e. biarticulate bars, can only carry axial forces, where a positive axial force will put the bar under tension and will increase its length, and a negative axial force will subject the bar to compression, and the bar will decrease in length. So to calculate the overall safety of a truss structure, we must calculate the axial force in each bar and then compare it to the strength of the corresponding bar. To calculate these internal forces, we must divide the structure into two parts, and this allows us to guarantee that the equilibrium of one of the parts yields the axial force in the bars that have been cut. When deciding how to divide a structure into two, we must ensure that the structure does not become indeterminate. So, we must make sure that the number of unknowns is less than or equal to the number of equilibrium equations. There are two common methods for calculating the internal forces in a structure. The method of sections, also known as the Ritter method, and then the method of joints. Both of these methods involve dividing the structure into two parts and then using equilibrium to calculate the internal forces in the cut bars. We will first have a look at the method of sections, where we will work through an example and then we will do the same for the method of joints. The method of sections is great for solving larger truss structures quickly and simply. Consider this truss which is in equilibrium. It is being supported by a hinge at point A and a roller at point G. Every horizontal and vertical bar is 5 metres long and therefore using Pythagoras theorem we can work out that each diagonal bar is approximately 7.07 metres in length. All bars are connected to one another via hinges, but we already knew that this must be the case for a truss. And finally, we have a vertical downwards load of 10 kN being applied to node J, and a vertical downwards load of 15 kN being applied to node L. For this example, we are going to use the method of sections to determine the internal forces in bars 3, 12 and 19. The first step for the method of sections is to calculate the reaction forces at the supports. Assuming sensors for the support reaction forces, we have a horizontal and vertical force at the hinge support and only a vertical force at the roller support. As we have seen many times before, we apply the conditions of equilibrium, where the sum of all horizontal forces must be equal to zero, the sum of all vertical forces must be equal to zero, and the sum of all moments relative to a point must be equal to zero, and we will choose node A to take the moments about. For the sum of all horizontal forces, we only have R A X, and so R A X is equal to zero. For the sum of all vertical forces, and taking the y coordinate direction to be positive, we have R A Y plus R G Y minus 10 minus 15 equals zero. And then taking the sum of all moments relative to node A, whilst taking the anticlockwise rotation direction to be positive, we get RGY times 30 minus 10 times 15 minus 15 times 25 equals 0. As equation 3 just has one unknown, which is RGY, we will rearrange for RGY, which equals 525 divided by 30, which equals 17.5 kilonewtons. And then we can substitute this value for RGY into equation 2. Doing so and then rearranging for RAY, we get RAY equals 10 plus 15 minus 17.5, which equals 7.5 kilonewtons. 
So now we can write these forces onto our diagram, and we can conclude that there is a vertical reaction force of 7.5 kN being applied in the upwards direction at node A, and there is a vertical reaction force of 17.5 kN being applied in the upwards direction at node G. Having calculated the support reaction forces, we must now divide the structure into two parts by making a cut along the bars that we're interested in. This method of cutting the bars that we're interested in is very useful as there's no need to solve the entire structure, saving us a lot of time. As we are interested in bars 3, 12 and 19, those are the bars we will cut, and so the cut will follow this line. For this example, we will now only focus on the left part of the structure, so we are left with this, and we will draw on the internal forces as extensions from the middle of the cut bars like so. Note here that we are assuming the senses of the internal forces to be tensile, as they are in the direction towards the end of the bars. We must still think of this structure as a single standing structure, where the conditions of equilibrium still apply, and so the sum of all horizontal forces, the sum of all vertical forces, and the sum of all moments must be equal to zero. The internal forces in the cut bars, F3, F12 and F19, are what stabilise the reactions and external forces being applied to the structure. Considering only the left part of the structure and taking the anti-clockwise rotation direction to be positive, the sum of all moments relative to node J is equal to negative 7.5 times 15 plus F3 times 5 equals 0. We have chosen node J to take the moment about as it allows us to isolate one of the unknowns. F19 and F12 both pass through node J and therefore do not cause a moment relative to node J. Therefore, as we only have the one unknown, we can already solve it. And doing so, we get F3 is equal to 7.5 times 15, all divided by 5, which equals 22.5 kilonewtons. Also note here that F3 is positive, and as we assumed all our unknowns to be tensile, we can conclude that F3 is in fact a tensile internal force of magnitude 22.5 kilonewtons, and so bar 3 is under tension. Now, taking the y-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all vertical forces is equal to 7.5 minus 10 minus F12 times sine 45, which equals 0. Again, we only have one unknown in this equation, so we can solve it straight away. And rearranging for F12, F12 is equal to 7.5 minus 10, all divided by sine 45, which equals negative 3.45 kilonewtons. In this instance, as our internal force is negative, that must mean that bar 12 is under compression. Finally, taking the x-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all horizontal forces is equal to F3 plus F19 plus F12 times cosine 45, which equals 0. As we have already determined the magnitudes of F3 and F12, we can simply substitute them into the equation. Doing this and then rearranging for F19, we get F19 equals negative 22.5 minus negative 3.54 times cosine 45, which equals negative 20 kilonewtons. So we can conclude that bar 19 is also under compression. And now, writing these forces onto our diagram gives a visual representation of the result. This method can be summarised into simple steps for ease of remembering. Firstly, start by calculating the reactions at the supports. Then make a slice through the members you wish to solve. Treat the part of the structure as its own static truss, and solve the truss by taking the sum of forces to equal zero. And finally, take the moment relative to a node with more than one unknown members. As a challenge, why don't you have a go at solving some of the other members in the truss? You're welcome to pause the video here and give it a go, and I'll show the internal forces for the remaining bars in a few seconds. Here are the internal forces for each bar then. Well done if you did attempt any further bars, and if you got them correct. Now we will take a look at the second method for solving trusses, the method of joints, which is also known as the node method. For this method, we must divide the structure such that we isolate a single node, and in order to obtain a determinate system of equations that we can solve, we must choose a node that has no more than two unknowns being applied to it, or in other words, only two bars. This is because for the node that we're considering, all bars will be converging to it, 
and so the moment around the point will be equal to zero, and therefore we'll only have two equilibrium equations we can use. Additionally, the two bars converging to the chosen node cannot be parallel, as this will leave us with a single equation with two unknowns. To learn the method of joints, we will consider this truss structure. The structure is being supported by a hinge support at node A and a roller support at node B. There is a vertical concentrated load of 10 kN being applied to the structure at node D in a downwards direction. Similarly to the method of sections, our first step is to calculate the reaction forces at the supports. Assuming sensors for the support reaction forces, we have a horizontal and vertical force at the hinge support, and only a horizontal force at the roller support. Applying the conditions of equilibrium, where the sum of all horizontal forces must be equal to zero, the sum of all vertical forces must be equal to zero, and the sum of all moments relative to a point must be equal to zero, which we will choose to be node A, we can calculate the reaction forces. Taking the x-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all horizontal forces is equal to RAx plus RBx equals zero. For the sum of all vertical forces and taking the y-coordinate direction to be positive, we have RAy minus 10 equals zero. So instantly we can see that RAy is equal to 10 kilonewtons. And then taking the sum of all moments relative to node A, whilst taking the anti-clockwise rotation direction to be positive, we get negative 10 times 4 minus RBx times 6 equals zero. Rearranging for RBx, we get RBx is equal to negative 10 times 4 all divided by 6, which equals negative 6.67 kilonewtons. Finally, we can substitute this value into our equation for the sum of horizontal forces. Doing so and rearranging for RAx, we get RAx equals 6.67 kilonewtons. So now we can write these forces onto our diagram, and we can conclude that there is a horizontal reaction force of 6.67 kilonewtons acting towards the right, and a vertical reaction force of 10 kilonewtons acting upwards at node A. And there is a horizontal reaction force of 6.67 kilonewtons acting in the left direction at node B. Now we must select our starting node. The node that we select must not have more than two connecting bars, so we could choose node A or node B. Isolating node A, we get the following diagram, where we have cut the bars 1 and 2. By considering the internal axial forces in bars 1 and 2, we can guarantee that both parts of the structure are in equilibrium. Before we can determine the axial forces, we must assume a sense for both of them, and here we will assume that they are positive, causing tension in both bars. Now it is simply a case of applying the conditions of equilibrium, and since we only have a single point, the moment of all forces relative to that point are equal to zero. Taking the x-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all horizontal forces is equal to 6.67 plus F1 equals zero. So we can instantly see that F1 is equal to negative 6.67 kilonewtons. Taking the y-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all vertical forces is equal to 10 plus F2, which equals zero. So again, we can see that F2 is equal to negative 10 kilonewtons. As we started by assuming that F1 and F2 were tensile axial forces, having calculated that they are negative, we can conclude that the axial force in bar 1 is a compressive force equal to 6.67 kilonewtons, and the axial force in bar 2 is also a compressive force, which is equal to 10 kilonewtons. For our example structure, every node now has no more than two converging unknown axial forces, and no set of unknown axial forces are parallel either so we can now choose any node we like. Taking a look at node D, we have the vertical load of 10 kN acting in the downwards direction, the compressive axial force of 6.67 kN in bar 1, and then an unknown axial force in bar 3 and in bar 4, which we will again assume to be positive. For node D, before we can apply the equations of equilibrium, we need to calculate the angles of bars 3 and 4 to allow us to calculate the horizontal and vertical components of the axial forces. Denoting the angle between the x-axis and bar 3 to be theta, and the angle between the x-axis and bar 4 to be alpha, 
we can now calculate the angles. Using trigonometry and the dimensions we have been given, we can work out that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of 4 over 4, which is 45 degrees, and alpha is equal to the inverse tangent of 6 over 2, which is 71.57 degrees. Now we can apply the conditions for equilibrium, where the sum of all horizontal forces must be equal to zero, and the sum of all vertical forces must be equal to zero. Taking the x-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all horizontal forces is equal to 6.67 minus F3 times cosine 45 plus F4 times cosine 71.57, and this equals zero. For the sum of all vertical forces and taking the y-coordinate direction to be positive, we have negative 10 plus F3 times sine 45 plus F4 times sine 71.57 and this equals zero. Now we have a set of simultaneous equations that we can solve to find our two unknowns. Looking at equation one first of all, we will rearrange to get F3 on its own, and doing so we get F3 equals 6.67 plus F4 times cosine 71.57, all divided by cosine 45. Now we can substitute this into equation two, which gives us an equation with only one known which is F4. Expanding the expression and then rearranging for F4, we can calculate that F4 is equal to 2.64 kilonewtons. You're welcome to pause the video here if you'd like to take a more detailed look at the equation manipulation we just carried out. Now we can substitute our known value for F4 into our starred equation above, giving us F3 equals 10.61 kilonewtons. We can add these to our diagram of the entire structure then, and as F3 and F4 are both positive, and as we assumed the sense for both to be tensile, we know that the axial forces in bars 3 and 4 are subjecting the bars to tension. Finally, we just need to determine the axial force in bar 5. For this, we follow the same steps that we have just completed. Firstly, we isolate node B, and denote the angles of the bars to allow us to calculate the horizontal and vertical components of the axial forces. We will denote the angle between the x-axis and bar 5 to be beta, and notice that for this example the structure is symmetrical about the line from node A to node B, so using intuition we know that the angle between the y-axis and bar 4 is also beta. Using trigonometry and the dimensions we've been given, we can work out that beta is equal to the inverse tangent of 2 over 6, which equals 18.43 degrees. Again, we will assume that the sense is positive for the axial force in bar 5, i.e. it's a tensile force. As F5 is the only unknown converging to node B, we only actually need to use one of the equations of equilibrium. So, taking the x-coordinate direction to be positive, the sum of all horizontal forces is equal to negative F5 times cosine 18.43 minus 2.64 times sine 18.43 minus 6.67, which equals zero. Rearranging for F5, F5 is equal to minus 2.64 times sine 18.43 minus 6.67, all divided by cosine 18.43, which equals negative 7.91 kilonewtons. To check that this is correct, we will calculate the sum of all vertical forces for node B. Taking the y-coordinate direction to be positive, this is equal to minus negative 7.91 times sine 18.43 minus 2.64 times cosine 18.43, which does equal zero. Therefore, going back to our diagram of the entire structure, we can conclude that the axial force in bar 5 is compressive of magnitude 7.91 kilonewtons. And now we can see the completely solved truss structure with the magnitudes of the internal forces for each bar and whether each bar is subject to tension or compression. To summarise the method of joints into some simple steps, firstly start by calculating the reactions at the supports, then isolate a node with no more than two unknowns converging to it, Treat that part of the structure as its own static structure. Solve the part by taking the sum of forces to equal zero. Once the unknowns have been found, move on to the next node with no more than two unknowns converging to it, 
and repeat for the rest of the structure. And do remember that the two unknowns cannot be parallel to each other. And now to summarise what we have covered in this video, we started by introducing the key principles of trust structures, moving on to internal forces within trust members, and we finished by learning how to solve a truss using the method of sections and the method of joints. This has been a video by Learn Civil Engineering. If you have found this video useful at all, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to show your support. If you do have any remaining questions or would like me to cover a specific topic, please leave them in the comment section below and I will try to respond as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.